Okay, so <clears throat> continuing on with our uh, SM1, SO2, E1, E2 reactions, uh, this next video is going to be on E1 elimination reactions. Now, in uh, general, uh, there's um, two basic types of elimination reactions that we are going to encounter this year. Uh, one is a 1-2 elimination, and one is a 1-1 elimination. This is otherwise known as that. The 1-2 is called a visceral elimination, and the 1-1 one -one is called a geminal elimination. And that just implies that you know um, you have a, uh, a proton and a leaving group, and if they come off of adjacent carbons or visceral carbons, that's the 1-2 elimination, and if they come off of the same carbon, that is um, the geminal elimination. Okay, um, <clears throat> when you do a 1-2 elimination, you end up with a double bond in the molecule, and when you do a 1-1 elimination, you end up with what's called a carbene, and um, that's a, it's, a, it's an unusual reaction. It's um, one that we'll encounter maybe two or three times during the course of the year with reactions we will do, um, but uh, if we're going to be looking at elimination reactions, then probably by far the reactions we're going to see this year are the 1-2 eliminations that result in alkenes. So just like we did with SN1 and SN2, E1 and E2 uh, mean the same thing. That's going to be elimination um, unimolecular for the uh, E1 and elimination uh, bimolecular for the E2. There's also a reaction known as an E1CB, which I will um, include in, in um, these uh, two videos here on eliminations. Um, I don't think E1CB is in uh, the Loudon textbook, um, but it's, it's well worth taking a look at. And uh, so if you ever do see it, you'll uh, kind of understand where it uh, comes from. So with the uh, E1, E2, so remember E2 reactions, um, one of the ways you can tell reactions E2 is you can do some kinetic studies because since it is second order kinetics, that means that by changing the concentration of either your, um, your base or your um, substrate, you're going to see a uh, change in the rate of the reaction. And just like with SN1, um, with E1, your kinetic studies will show you that it really doesn't matter uh, what you do with your base, your concentration of your base, your strength of your base, uh, because E1 reactions are only dependent upon the rate determining step, which is the loss of your um, your halide or your leaving group, loss of your leaving group. And um, so it is independent of the concentration of anything else in the beaker. So you can change the concentration of those other things, but it won't affect the rate of the reaction. And then also just like with E2 reactions, um, E2 reactions uh, are going to be one-step reactions, and so um, they are under geometry stair control. And just like SN1 reactions, your E1 reactions are multi-step reactions, and they are under um, electronic control. Can you form an intermediate carbocation? So just like with SN1 reactions, with E1 reactions, you have to make sure you have the right solvent, methanol, ethanol, water, in order to make sure that you can make the intermediate carbocation so that the reaction um, will be able to uh, proceed. So um, then um, if, if, if it seems like you know a lot of the um, hallmarks of E2 are the same as SN2, and a lot of the hallmarks of E1 are the same as SN1, then a good question is, well then what's the difference? How do I know whether or not I'm doing elimination or substitution? And one of the big things to always look out for is um, the temperature of the reaction. The uh, temperature of the reaction is going to um, help you determine whether or not um, the reaction is under uh, elimination conditions or substitution conditions. Um, substitution is favored by higher temperatures. And that's because if we um, take a look at uh, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, right? So um, entropy is affected by temperature. And so if you think about an elimination reaction, in an elimination reaction, um, you are going to have a, a, a starting material that's going to uh, be uh, changed into more things than it started with. Because when you do an elimination reaction, you're shedding things from the backbone of the molecule. And so that means you're increasing entropy. And since an increase in entropy, well, when you raise the temperature, that's going to make your delta G more negative, which is going to make the reaction more spontaneous, which just means that that's why you're going to favor higher temperatures um, uh, towards uh, elimination reactions. Um, if you're looking at uh, comparing elimination versus substitution, right? so I would say here that um, a, a typical um, substitution reaction would follow the order of, um, like, let's say, A plus B goes to C plus D. It's got to be like some, you know, SN2 reaction. Um, you have uh, um, this molecule. You got this thing you want to substitute on it. So you put that thing on. You kick out a leaving group. You or exchange these two things. And so you pretty much you know, end up with the same number of molecules as you um, started with. In elimination reactions, however, that is different because it's sort of like saying um, A goes to B plus 
C if I'm eliminating you know stuff off the backbone of a, uh, a carbon chain. So therefore, if you're if A, one thing, goes to B plus C, two things, that's an increase in entropy. So therefore, if you want to maximize on that, if you want to take advantage of it, raise your temperature. That means you have a larger um, entropic contribution towards your delta G, and so you're being more likely, more favorable to be a spontaneous reaction if you are going to raise the temperature, okay? The other hallmark to look at um, is uh, the strength of the base that you're going to use um, for favoring the reaction, but that actually only uh, is important for E2 elimination reactions. And uh, for this uh, video, what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at E1 elimination, so I'll save that uh, for the, uh, the uh, E2 elimination video. So for an E1 mechanism, um, this is a multi-step mechanism, just like it was for SN1. The uh, rate determining step is forming the intermediate carbocation, just like it was for SN1. And um, the ability to form the carbocation is uh, the whole, that's the whole shebang for an E1 um, reaction. And so um, these are going to be favored at higher temperatures, but just like SN1, you still have to have a good leaving group. And so if you look at the screen here, we're saying we have this tertiary alkyl chloride. We do an elimination in water and uh, we get two products, a major and a minor product. So um, when we do this, um, I would say that over the arrow, the thing to always look for is um, heat which is abbreviated with the big delta, capital delta, um, for heat. Sometimes textbooks will say that um, the uh, if it says over the arrow that the temperature is 100 degrees or 150 degrees, then that's what you should think about as that's going to be uh, a hint that it's elimination. But that's actually you know kind of bogus because um, there are plenty of elimination reactions that uh, will go at uh, below 100 degrees, and there are plenty of elimination reactions that you really have to heat up quite a bit higher um, in order to get them to go. So rather than put an actual number or temperature over the arrow, because that you know that, that value will change from reaction to reaction depending upon the specific conditions of reaction, rather than deal with that, um, I will say that um, you know if you um, just put a capital delta over an arrow, if you see that, that's your hint. That's what I'm trying to say is implying at some high temperature, what's going to happen? Well, at some high temperature, you know the more you raise the temperature, the higher it goes, the more likely it will be elimination. So, um, but you know, then again, if you do see, you know, temperatures over the hour of like 100, 150, 200 degrees, yeah, of course, uh, you're, you're, we're trying to transmit the information to you as a hint that we are trying to get you to think about doing elimination because um, we do our substitution reactions at temperatures lower than that, okay? So on the screen here, um, we have an elimination, an E1 elimination, and uh, we have a major and minor product, and how do, we, how do we get there and how do we predict, um, you know, what is the major, what is the minor? So the mechanism for this reaction is going to be, where um, you know step number one of course is you've got to have your best nucleophile going after best electrophile that here is going to be loss of the chloride taking electrons with it and so when that happens you get a carbocation now um, the carbocation here is a tertiary cation and it can actually eliminate from uh, two different sides um, in this reaction right if I eliminate from this side by pulling off proton here I'll make this alkene if I eliminate by pulling off one of the terminal methyls over here I'll make this alkene now you might want to think, you know, um, if you look at this, well, actually, isn't it true that if I take off one of these three protons here, I'll eliminate and make an alkene here, which is the same as uh, if I'm eliminating here. So there's actually six ways of making the terminal alkene, because I got six protons. There's only two ways of making the uh, internal alkene here, because I only have two protons there. So um, if this reaction were under um, kinetic control, then I would say that uh, the major product should be the one where you eliminate and you make the outside um, um, terminal alkene. That's uh, six times more, or not six times, it's three times more likely, right, because it's a six to two ratio. So three times more likely to make the um, alkene eliminate from the outer, uh, outer side. But since we're seeing, that I showed in the previous slide, that the major product is the one where the alkene is here on the inside, well, that tells you that it is not under kinetic control, it's aura or electronic control, it's under thermodynamic control. And so, okay, so once I have the cation, then um, what I can do here is I can say that um, I have a proton here, and if I have a, a base, in this case, um, I have a really, really good electrophile, right? Because I have a bare plus charge on this intermediate here. So do I have to use a really strong base like sodium hydroxide? No, not at all, right? I can take a, a base like H2O, use the lone pair of electrons, Nucleophile goes after electrophile, nucleophile goes after electrophile, and that will eliminate to make my uh, first product there. Um, if you want to abbreviate it, you know, go ahead and say, just use a general base, which I'll do on the second one here. So if I'll use general base, nucleophile goes after electrophile, nucleophile goes after electrophile, and that gives me the uh, alkene in the, uh, in the other position. 
So then why is it that, uh, you know, um, the internal alkene is the major product and the external alkene is the uh, minor product? Well, that is a Zaitsev's rule. And uh, Zaitsev's rule um, says that um, more substituted double bonds are thermodynamically more stable. The uh, alkene on the left is a tri-substituted alkene because it has one R group, two R groups, three R groups surrounding the uh, alkene. And the alkene on the right only has two R groups, a, an ethyl and a methyl. Over here, these are hydrogens, so they don't count for substitution. And so therefore, if I've got you know three versus two, well, with three wins, it's more substituted, so it's thermodynamically more favorable. These, uh, this reaction is under thermodynamic control, and so therefore, we're going to um, get the more substituted um, alkene as the major alkene, okay? The uh, important thing here is, though, remember, it's, it's, it's about the, uh, the, the, uh, the heat. You have to have heat to get this to go. Because if you did this reaction at a low temperature, then we're back to um, an E1 reaction where the water is going to substitute in, and we're just going to end up with an alcohol um, for this reaction, the uh, tertiary alcohol, right? Okay, so high heat will favor elimination in this uh, reaction. <laughs> so if you look at um, this, then um, we can explain how this happens in this reaction by going back and thinking about our SN1 reactions, because remember, with an SN1 reaction, you have an intermediate carbocation. And if a carbocation can rearrange, it will rearrange. There's nothing you can do to stop it from rearranging, as long as it's going to make a more stable carbocation in the rearrangement, right? So, um, you know, with problems like this, you know, you don't want to think too much about how it's going to happen. You just want to go ahead and go step by step by step through the mechanism, and that will show you the answer. So here we're going to take the starting material, and we're going to say the first thing that happens is going to be, of course, the best nucleophile goes after the best electrophile. And so in this case, um, the way we're going to do this is we're going to have the chloride be a good leaving group. And that leaving group is just going to drop off best nucleophile, goes after the best electrophile to make the stable chloride conjugate base, which is a good leaving group. That, of course, will leave behind a secondary cation. Now, if the chloride had been on a primary carbon, yeah, we want to be careful about doing that because um, we don't form primary carbocations. But this is a secondary. It's, uh, it's not the best cation, um, but it's a cation. It'll, it'll work, right? But what's better than a secondary? A tertiary. And so here when I look at this, I can say, well, you know what? If I just do a one, two, some, some shift, and I have the best nucleophile go after the best electrophile, with the best nucleophile here being the intramolecular nucleophile, then I'm going to do a one, two, some, some shift, which is going to result in me producing um, a tertiary cation. And you know what? That's not just a tertiary cation. That's a special tertiary cation because that's a benzylic cation. And so it's got, uh, yeah, it's got hyperconjugation because it's got, you know, one thing here, a second thing here, and a third thing here, all hyperconjugatively, you know, dumping electrons in to um, stabilize that plus charge. But way better than that is the residence contributors I can draw where I can make use of the electrons in the uh, six-membered ring to uh, draw residence contributors where the plus charge can be here or it can be here, or it can be here, or it can be here, right? So lots of resonance stabilization there. So yes, we just went downhill in our shift where we did our one, two, some, some shift on the uh, previous intermediate. And so then um, from here, we can say in order to finish the reaction, we uh, still have charge. We got a plus charge there, benzylic, and it's benzylic. So you might say oh, it's really stable, but it still is plus charge. Every time we have charge, we hate charge. We want to get rid of charge. How do you do that? I'm just going to take a general base here. Now, in this case, the general base is actually methanol, but um, I'm going to abbreviate it with B minus. Nucleophile goes after electrophile, nucleophile goes after electrophile, and when I do that, that gives me my alkene in the um, correct position here for um, the uh, tetra substituted uh, double bond that I make. Make sense?